Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, can mean always feeling short of breath. What a difficult way to live. So what are the causes and other symptoms of COPD? And what treatments are available to help? Our guest this week is a primary care internist who will provide the answers to these and other COPD questions on Health Talk. So stay tuned for an important and informative show. Health Talk is up next. Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today we're going to discuss COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, with Dr. Don McNichol. He's a primary care physician associated with Darien Primary Care. Don, it's great to have you back on Health Talk. Eric, nice to see you. So, this is, a, I know, also an area of your special expertise and interest, the pulmonary diseases. We're talking about COPD. We see a lot of ads for COPD on TV. Why don't we start off by just telling people what it is? Well, COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and it's a group of diseases that are characterized by narrowing of the airways uh, and difficulty breathing. Uh, they have very different uh, origins and causes, and they're treated in different ways. Um, well, let's say, so what are, the, what are some of the causes, and are there things people can, can, prevent, can do to prevent getting COPD? Don't smoke. Yeah, smoking is... A, is I mean, we, they hear this from this program all the time, but it's, tell, expound, expound upon that a little bit. Smoking is the primary cause of most COPD, uh, particularly emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Uh, it is uh, the easily uh, the most dangerous thing you can do to your body uh, that you willfully do. Uh, we should point out this is not um, this is not cancer. This is damage to the airways that leaves you short of breath. Correct. Obviously, smoking causes other problems, too. But what we're talking about here is the damage to the lungs that is caused by the myriad poisons and tars and so forth that are in the uh, cigarette smoke. Um, it sets up an inflammation in the airways, um, which is, in most cases, not terribly destructive, uh, but can be become very destructive, if you're, especially if you're deficient in the enzymes uh, in your own body that will prevent that breakdown from happening. So as a patient, I may say, well, I've got an Uncle Joe who smoked for 80 years and he's as healthy as can be. Can you predict who is more at risk for COPD uh, by looking at family history or anything else? That's a good question. Uh, there, it's hard to predict who will develop COPD because certainly not everybody who smokes gets COPD. Uh, and I think they're beginning to learn more about the uh, uh, family history and immune, immune, immunology of COPD. Uh, for example, one of the recommendations now um, is that people, anybody who has COPD or who has an abnormal breathing function test should get tested for their alpha-1 antitrypsin levels. That's a chemical that exists in the, in the blood and the lungs which helps prevent the breakdown of this tissue. That's familial. There are people who have, you, you, you'll find families where several people in the family had COPD that seemed worse than it should have been for the amount of smoking that they had, mm -hmm. or they got it earlier than you might have anticipated. Now, this is interesting for me. I, I certainly learned in medical school about those families rare with full anti, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency who could develop fibrosis and other lung problems. Are they learning now that people with intermediate levels or lower normal levels may be at greater risk? for these types of problems? Absolutely. Uh, they're finding that the, the frequency of this condition is, is much greater than was thought before because now they have easy ways to test for it and they have medicines to treat it. Uh, so what they're finding is that, that a lot of people have abnormal alpha-1 levels that don't, haven't developed any symptoms yet. Uh, but if you check them and you check their family members, you'll find out that they have Sometimes a little bit of a deficiency, sometimes a lot of a deficiency. There are sort of complicated ways you can figure out which, which is a more severe case than others. But Is like, this something people should go in and ask their doctors for this test, or is this more a research tool at this point? It's definitely a test that is useful and is used, is, is used to treat people successfully to yeah. prevent COPD. First, you tell people to stop smoking. Yeah, I mean, we do that I, I anyway. was going to go back to that yeah. because I think that I, I don't want people to think, well, I've got to find levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin, and therefore I can smoke to my heart's content. Right, because obviously there are other things smoking does for you that are bad. But, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's just a, a tool. 
um, and makes you more aware of the people who you have to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, Does it correlate more with uh, how much you smoke, whether you smoke filtered cigarettes or in, anything like that, or is it, uh, again, sort of certain people are more susceptible than others? Certain people seem to be more susceptible to others, and that's, that's true for a number of different lung diseases. Uh, Certain people develop a, a kind of COPD that, that causes you to have low oxygen levels, for example, but not all COPD does that. There are different forms of COPD. Um, Do we know what determines which form of COPD you develop? No. Uh, we can't really <laughs> pre predict that a priori. And it's usually off, it's uh, often a mixture but leading one, more, more towards one or the other. Usually we'll, we'll get someone who has, a, has symptoms uh, and gets worked up for their condition and then we backwards look and we can figure out what kind of COPD they have and how we best might treat them. So let's, let's go back to the, the symptoms because I think we, we talked about the disease in, in isolation. What are the symptoms of COPD? The primary symptom is shortness of breath. People will be uh, abnormally short of breath for a given amount of ex exertion, for example. They used to be able to go up the flight of stairs in their house without any problem and now they get to the top and they have to stop for a few minutes. Um, so What's the threshold for saying this is abnormal? Is it one flight of stairs? Well, in, you know, in, the, in, the old, in the old days, we used to talk about stair climbing as a way of testing people's functional capacity, uh, particularly with COPD. So if they can walk up two flights of stairs and they're not short of breath, their COPD is probably not that significant. So that's sort of an old-fashioned functional test. Um, but uh, anybody who comes in with shortness of breath, uh, who has a history of smoking, and usually is over the age of 40 uh, is a candidate to be tested. And just to point out to people who have never seen somebody with COPD, this could be a horrible way to live. Advanced COPD is a terrible way to live. You're short of breath all the time. You can't, you can't walk from here to there uh, without having to take a rest. The inhalers help, but they don't cure it. Uh, and it does tend to progress over time, even after you smoke. You know, um, it's, it's really, so this is, this is not one of those things saying, well, I can live with the symptoms or it, you know, coughing a little bit in the morning isn't that bad. It, it can be really a devastating. I've seen, obviously, a number of patients with advanced COPD. I'm sure it's a big part of your practice. It's, it's a, just a horrible, it's, it's torture it's, it's for people. It's a horrible uh, condition. And one of the interesting things that happens to people is that they do start to limit their activities over a long period of time. So they, you ask them, are you short of breath? And they say, well, no, I'm fine. But you say, well, when was the last time you went up your two flights of steps? They say, well, I don't really do that anymore. I kind of do it once a day. They restrict their lives. They shrink their lives to accommodate the symptoms. And they're not even aware. And they're, they're not doing. even aware of the fact that they're doing it. So if, if for viewers at home, they should be asking them if they're smoking or we didn't talk about occupational exposures. But uh, if, if they're at risk, they should ask themselves, have I limited my activity? Am I short, abnormally short of breath? Right. And your doctor should be asking that question, too. And so somebody comes to you and routine primary care, they're a smoker, or maybe they work in a dusty job and they don't wear a mask. Uh, what do you do? Well, how, do you, how do you manage them from, well, first from the I beginning? Wanna, I, first, I want to make the diagnosis. Right. And particularly with COPD, which is, includes uh, chronic bronchitis and emphysema as its two major components, both of those will have an abnormal breathing function test uh, by the time they've become symptomatic. So I'll do a breathing function test, which is a simple uh, blow into a tube as hard as you can. And you do it a few times, then we give a treatment, and you do it again. And it's not painful, and not it's easy, painful, and it's done at the bedside. It's done in the exam room, really. Yeah, very easy to do. Um, and you can see then, is there an abnormality in their airflow? Uh, and that will give you a clue that there is an early problem with the, with the, uh, the tubules okay. that are leading to the lungs. Do you test everybody who smokes or do you wait till they say they have symptoms or they cough in the morning? You know, what's the threshold where people at home should seek, should specifically seek help for this or you as a doctor begin to look for it? A chronic cough that doesn't go away, uh, especially if it's productive of sputum, uh, particularly in the morning, is a good reason to come in and get tested. Um, shortness of breath that doesn't go away or it isn't just temporary uh, of any kind should be evaluated uh, right away. And, um, and so, and there are treatments for this, right? Sure, we have, we have treatments and have had treatments for a long time um, for the various forms of COPD. 
Um, and now we have a myriad of different products out there, which are various yeah. combinations of things. But we go into so that. before we actually go on to that, I wanted to. You talked about chronic bronchitis and emphysema, sort of as ends of the spectrum of COPD. Maybe you could define. I, I remember learning about the blue bloater and the pink puffer. Right. The pink puffer being emphysema, and the blue bloater being, being the chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis. Yeah. Maybe you could, for folks at home, at least give them the idea of what are the what's going on in these two different manifestations of this disease we call COPD? Well, every doctor remembers the, the famous Frank Netter pictures. Frank Netter was a medical artist who uh, you know, did these beautiful paintings of the human body. And there's a picture of a blue bloater who is sitting- Actually, I remember those too. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Everybody, everybody <laughs> saw these. Uh, the blue bloater is a person who is blue because his or her oxygen level is low. They're hypoxic. Um, and they tend to be uh, edematous, they retain water, they, they have no energy, they, don't wanna, they can't really do very much, they cough a lot, they bring up a lot of phlegm all the time. Uh, the pink puffer is what we call emphysema, uh, is a, someone whose oxygen level is normal, so their skin is pink, their, their color is good. Um, and they are short of breath on exertion, but not at rest. Uh, in practice, we kind of treat them the same way because mm -hmm. we have the limited number of, of medicines to use, but uh, the pink puffer, uh, they have slightly different prognostic uh, futures, but basically those are the two types we talk about. But yeah. it's gotten more complicated than that. Uh, the way we characterize obstructive lung diseases uh, has, has become more complicated than pink puffers and blue bloaters. So we've got about two and a half minutes left. You see this patient, you say they've got COPD, you tell them to stop smoking. Right. And by the way, do you want to just say two, two seconds worth of occupational that people should be obviously protecting themselves? And sure. I mean, if you work anywhere where there's a lot of dust or fumes or, uh, you know, paint flying around, or uh, you should certainly wear a respirator and that should, that's, that should be part of your employer's uh, responsibility. Yeah. And don't Make be sure cavalier about it. Yeah, don't be cavalier about it. You may be young, but you still aren't going to live forever, so. Uh. Well put. <laughs> Um, so treatment is, we, we go back to the uh, 30 years ago when people would come in with an exacerbation of their COPD, meaning they've been fine for a while, now they're super short of breath and coughing and they may have a fever and they may have a, an upper lung, uh, respiratory infection. We know that treating with antibiotics and steroids of those people worked. You, know, you give them oral steroids, prednisone or intravenous steroids, they would get better. So the, the thought was to add a steroid to your inhalational regimen uh, to see if you could reduce the frequency of exacerbations and maybe even prolong the life. And we have one minute left, so I want to make okay, sure I'll, we have enough. Okay, I'll, I'll sum keep it going. up quickly. The, um, the, 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 it turns out the inhaled steroids in one study would look very promising. In other studies, didn't look very promising. In the end, we've, we've come to conclude that they're probably a good thing, that, that people who have a certain kind of severe COPD uh, are, are going to benefit from the inhaled steroids along with the inhaled bronchodilators, meaning the, the medicines that open up your airways. So in practice, we use uh, both drugs on, on, on this population of people. There are also uh, anti-muscarinic agents, we call them, which are anticholinergic things like Spiriva, uh, which work at a different part of the airway. So a lot of people with COPD will be on three different drugs. Uh, to open up their airways. And now, I know there's a big ad now about uh, some drug that combines all three. Is there any advantage to combining the three rather than using a couple of different inhalational agents? Well, I remember talking to uh, representatives from the drug companies years ago saying, why don't we put this into a three-drug cocktail because we're all using this. And finally, they did. Uh, and, you know, they'll show you the studies from their work that shows that it works a little bit better than the, the, the two drug combinations, but it makes sense. Okay. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for. There is help. Well, we did get a chance today, but this really can help people feel better. It definitely can help people feel better, and it can reduce exacerbation rates, which is the, the end all and be all of COPD treatment. Thank you so much, Don. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I really want to thank my guest, Dr. Don McNichol, for joining me on Health Talk today and discussing this really important topic. Please share your questions and comments with Community Relations at Nuance Health by calling 203-852-2250. We'd love to hear from you, and thanks so much for watching.
Asthma is a chronic respiratory condition that can make breathing difficult and uncomfortable. It can affect children and adults alike and can even be life-threatening. The good news is that there is help available for asthma sufferers. On this week's Health Talk, our guests will discuss the causes, symptoms, diagnosis, and the treatment for asthma. So please stay tuned, we're up next. Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today we're going to discuss asthma with Dr. Don McNichol. He's a primary care doctor with Darien Primary Care. Don, welcome to Health Talk. It's good Thank to you, have Eric. you. Thank you. So we're going to talk about asthma today. Uh, everybody hears that. Everybody sort of thinks they know what it is. What is it, really? Asthma is an inflammatory condition of the lungs and the airways, which results in narrowing of the airways that causes people to wheeze and cough and make them feel short of breath. So. We hear about this in all sorts of contexts, kids with asthma. Maybe you could start, unpack that a little bit for us. You know, what kinds of asthma are there out there that you see, it or even that a pediatrician may see? It used to be that we talked about allergic asthma and non-allergic asthma, or intrinsic asthma and extrinsic asthma. Now there are like five or six different kinds of asthma, and that's because we've learned more and more about the immunogenicity of the disease and how the immune system responds to other factors that uh, worsens it or, or protects you from it. So we, we still talk about allergic versus non-allergic. Uh, allergic asthma has a little bit better uh, ability to be treated. Um, and what do we mean by that, allergic asthma? I mean, I always think of allergies as my nose running and my eyes itching. Right. I think the, the best way to think of it is that there is a constellation of conditions that are called atopic diseases. Atopic just meaning allergic. So atopic dermatitis, which is an allergic problem with the skin, uh, allergic rhinitis of the nose, asthma, um, and there are a few others that are, are in, lumped into that category. And some people just seem to have a lot of these themse themselves. They're prone to it, um, and it, it presents at different parts of their lives. So this is an immune system that's sort of overreactive to things in our environment. That's the current thinking, yes. That, uh, and the, the fact that it's increasing in frequency for the last 50 years uh, is, is uh, thought to be due to the increasing amount of uh, allergens that we're exposed to uh, that trigger it. Most people with allergic asthma will, will get asthma attacks in the fall and the spring uh, when they are exposed to greater amounts of uh, uh, antigens, uh, but they can go all, all year round. Antigens, you mean pollens uh, in pollens the air? Pollens and dusts and uh, trees and so forth. Um, but asthma can be triggered also by uh, infections, upper respiratory infections, viruses. Uh, almost anything that affects the lung can trigger the asthma. I remember even hearing about exercise-induced asthma and cold-induced asthma. Uh, and the, it's interesting that we've known about these for many, many years, that people, some people get short of breath when they exercise and they wheeze and need to be treated for it. We don't exactly know why that happens, uh, but it's something that's easily, easily treated. So, so what's really happening here is that whatever the stimulation, the, the airways, the bronchial tubes, are squeezing down and providing a, a tighter passage for air to get through. So it's trying to like breathe through a straw, right, except that, it's inside the, your lungs. That's the analogy we use. It's, it's imagine yourself breathing through a straw. Uh, pretty uncomfortable. That's pretty uncomfortable. And uh, well, tell who, who gets it? Do we understand who gets this? Uh, yes, the, the asthma begins to appear in early uh, adolescence and childhood uh, and a little bit later than the other allergic diseases. Um, but people who tend to be allergic to a lot of things are at risk for asthma. Um, but there's a lot of uh, people who are not allergic to other things and who, d who develop asthma anyway. And we have uh, much more sophisticated testing now to figure out who those people are and ha how they best might be treated. So when, when does a parent or a patient begin to get worried that maybe this is, well, we all get a cold or a bronchitis, we can cough a little bit or wheeze for a little bit while afterwards, a week or so. When, when do you start to worry about that and you say, hey, maybe I ought to go see my doctor? It's usually after repeated episodes of the same thing. Uh, someone will say, gee, I, every time I get a cold, I start to wheeze and I get short of breath and uh, it gets treated and it goes away and then I'm fine for a while and then it comes back again. Uh, or it's a, it's a person who develops a, a wheeze and a cough after a, 
lung infection or an upper respiratory infection who doesn't completely get better and has a persistent cough with wheezing that goes on from weeks and even months. They don't hear wheezing, does that mean they don't have asthma, definitely? Definitely not, no. If you don't hear wheezing, you could still have asthma. So you can measure that with the same, with a breathing function test to see how uh, well they're moving air so in and out So cough and wheezing are both sort of alarm symptoms that if they're persistent or recurrent, Correct. Uh, you have to worry about that. Correct. And then how do, you, how do you make the diagnosis? Uh, asthma is, is a diagnosis that's made by history, first of all. <coughs> so you, you know that they've had this history of coughing and wheezing over the past couple of years or year. Um, and then a breathing function test will confirm whether you have abnormal airways that are uh, just reacting uh, and you give them a treatment and it comes back to normal or they're not reacting and that will give you a different prognostic uh, look, look at the airways. Thing. We all have muscles in our airways that cause can cause constriction, correct? Right, and uh, it used to be thought that that was the primary problem with asthma, with the muscles of the airways constrict and narrow the airways, but now we know it's primarily an inflammatory yeah. disease. And that a, makes the muscles sort of extra sensitive. And right, and you can treat the muscles, but, but you can't, you gotta treat the inflammation if you wanna make it go away. Yeah, I remember that, that discovery occur, occurred during my period of practice, a, a real change of thinking. But this is a diagnosis you can usually make uh, in the office, in the examining room, using the breathing test? Yes, it's, as I said, it's, it's historically based. It's, it's based on exam, based on story, and based on the results of the breathing function test. And before we get into treatment, are there anything people can do to lower their risk of getting asthma? Let's say they're in a family with a history of asthma and, or an allergic phenomenon. Particularly if they're allergic, uh, yes, you try to avoid the things you're allergic to and we refer people to uh, allergists to get tested for that, and uh, we have lots of sophisticated ways to find out what you're allergic to, and you can avoid those things. You avoid the triggers, and the frequency of the asthmatic attacks goes down. Uh, how about smoking? Does that play any role in asthma? I know there's certain overlap with bronchospasm and COPD, but does it play any role in asthma, what we call asthma? Sure, smoking makes every lung disease worse. Uh, so no matter what your underlying disease is, it'll get worse if you're smoking. Let me, let me ask you about the substitutes for smoking that we vaping and maybe even the use of recreational use of uh, marijuana. Well, there's not a lot of, of data uh, on these subjects. Obviously, they're in the news recently uh, that it looks like they're a little more dangerous than we thought they were. Uh, we don't exactly know why, but uh, people come in saying, gee, why, why can't I vape? Because there's no, it's just nicotine. It's not going to hurt me. And it turns out there are, there are things in that vaping steam that, that are not necessarily good for you, and there can be impurities, and so there are cases of pneumonia have developed, and so we don't, I don't really recommend it to anybody. Yeah, so it's, it's, this stuff is, could be. Let me ask you one other sort of peripheral question, and that is, uh, we know the immune system gets conditioned during infancy and early childhood, and uh, so that certain, I mean, it used to be we wanted to keep everything absolutely sterile for infants, and then we, that might not be as good an idea uh, because the immune system is, is really doesn't mature if it's not exposed to things. Does that play any role in asthma that we know of? I mean, are people too clean with their infants? Uh, I don't know if I'd say you're too clean with their infants, but I think it's, it's fair to say that if you eat something that's fallen on the floor, you're probably actually helping yourself more than you are hurting yourself. Which is sort of an ironic... Uh, it's, a, it's an old idea called the, the hygiene theory of, of asthma that if you keep yourself in a sterile, clean environment, your immune system never gets exposed to those antigens which can sort of mature it and train it not to overreact when it comes in contact later. And a little hard to do studies on it, but, but it's, it's a generally accepted theory that maybe that's why there's more asthma now than there was 25 or 30 or 50 years ago. It's just that people are not exposed to dirt, right. farmyards you know, all that uh, kind of exposure. Yeah, and I, I know we have just ra been involved with the ra raising of a couple of grandchildren and uh, their mother was, we talked about that as they were young and she was very uh, liberal in terms of their, their germ exposure and they've done just fine. Yeah. But let, let's go on to treatment. Somebody comes in and uh, they have a history. Where do you go with that? Where, and what should patients expect? This is one of the newer things uh, that's, uh, some of the new things in asthma treatment are um, we, we have long, t for long thought we never want to give uh, an inhaled bronchodilator without a steroid uh, because the inhaled bronchodilator may, may help the uh, airways to open, but it doesn't correct the inflammation. So you may feel better for a while. It masks the symptoms. Um, and 
So you want to always have somebody on an inhaled steroid uh, to protect against that. Um, the new thing is that it may be okay to use the inhaled steroids as needed. The inhaled steroids, really? Yeah, uh, because they figure a little bit is better than none. Uh, people are not that, not that co uh, committed to using their steroids sometimes because they don't get immediate relief And before it. we get people too confused at home, these steroids are not the anabolic steroids that athletes are using. Right. They're these the are anti-inflammatory anti -inflammatory steroids like prednisone and budesonide and all those. Um, so the, the studies that have been done show that if you just use a combination of a bronchodilator and a steroid, meaning the, the, the airway and, uh, muscle thing and the, and the steroid, whenever you need it, uh, that seems to protect you as well as taking the steroid all yeah. the time. Uh, so that's kind of a new thing. And it, 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 it's technically still off-label, meaning the FDA hasn't completely approved that use, but everybody kind of accepts that it's not a bad idea. And it's really it because the long-term use of these drugs, uh, people worry about bone loss and, and cataracts and things like that. I try to downplay the long-term uh, downsides of the inhaled steroids because they're pretty small. And so they don't really get into the circulation Right. The amount of uh, drug that's absorbed into the circulation is pretty small. They, they found with children, for example, that, that growth is not really affected mm -hmm. by the use of steroids uh, in, in early is one For a while, people were talking about certain ones being absorbed more than others. Uh, is one steroid better or worse for inhalation than another? Not in my opinion. I, I think uh, the, the best steroid is any steroid that that, that person will use properly. No, I know the steroids are now available over the counter for nasal sprays. I was sort of surprised the other day to put on, put on what, fluticasone for mm -hmm. my uh, allergic rhinitis or, or allergies, and I was surprised that it was available over the counter. Are, are, do you see steroids being available over the counter for asthma in the future, or do you think they need to be managed by a doc? Yeah, I don't see that happening. Uh, allergic rhinitis doesn't kill people. Yeah. Uh, and asthma can. If you're un under treating asthma or you're treating it wrong and you're using the wrong technique uh, for you treating using your steroids, you could be in big trouble. So yeah. I, I maybe don't you can say a few words about that because asthma, we, we can think of it as a childhood, a, a, disease, uh, a minor disease, but it does kill people. Sure. Uh, and asthma related deaths are, are, are still common. For a while, they were saying the death rate wasn't going down or might even be creeping up because of the use of some of these medicines. Is that true now? Well, when the long-acting bronchodilators came out, the, uh, the, medicines that, <coughs> uh, the medicines that open up the airways and don't have any anti-inflammatory effect, when the long-acting versions of those inhalers came out, they did some studies uh, with uh, asthmatics, and they didn't give them steroids, uh, and there was a greater death rate in the people who took the inhaled bronchodilators by themselves. For a long time, it was felt that there was something intrinsic about the bronchodilators that was dangerous, and there isn't. It was just the fact they weren't taking the steroids. Uh, so for 15 years, there were black box warnings on all these drugs that it was dangerous to use but it. But that's what I'm day. reacting to. Yeah, and, and uh, we in the pulmonary community more or less tried to calm people down. They'd, it's not dangerous to use this drug, but you must use your steroid when you're using it. This is why it really should be managed and reviewed by a skilled practitioner right. and not managed at home. Right. So the, the, some of the over-the-counter stuff that people can buy, I don't know if it's still available, I don't want to use a brand name, but... Uh, uh, well, I just read an article about that recently. It, it's coming back. Uh, there, was a br there was a brand, an over-the-counter brand for treating asthma, which was gone for a long time, and now it's coming back. Uh, I'd not recommend against that. I'm, a rec I'm recommending against that unless it's under my supervision. Um, and we have just a few seconds left. The future, the treatment of asthma. I know there are new drugs coming up. Some are even advertised on TV. We're making great strides with medications that treat the immunology of, of asthma. And uh, it's a small group of, of patients who have severe asthma that's not, treating, not getting treated well or isn't responding to the usual treatment. And these newer agents, uh, are going to help with that. They're, they're expensive. They're, they're had to be given by injection. They often have to get, be given in the office every two weeks. It's not easy. But if, you're, if your breathing has helped with it, then it, it's probably a good option for a lot of people. It's a remarkable time for asthma as well as so many other diseases because the pharmaceutical range is just exploding. And unfortunately, we've run out of time. 
but there's certainly if you have asthma, it can be treated, and it sounds like even if you have severe asthma, you have reason to hope given the, uh, the new agents that are becoming available. So we have run out of time. I want to thank my guests for joining me on Health Talk today and discussing asthma, a very important topic. Please share your questions and comments with Community Relations at New Vance Health by calling 203-852-2250. We would really love to hear from you. Thanks so much for watching.